An important caveat, because if swearing offends you, I suggest you fuck off and stop being so bloody precious. So, one reason I'm giving this talk is this dude. Uh, he's a dude called Sal Saeed Malikpour. I'll talk about him a bit later, but just have this dude in your head whilst I give this talk. So, this is a talk of multiple parts. The first part is basically about interesting data sets, what we have found. So, before we begin, I'm going to digress, and you'll probably get bored at this point. I spoke here in 2012 about legacy technologies, and I, as usual, made a bit of, tit a bit of a tit of myself. Because I claimed that an organization called Al-Mujahideen was actually Al-Mujahideen. Al-Mujahideen, for those of you that don't know them, are basically Al-Qaeda's PR arm. And I found an X-25 link in Iran, which I thought was them. And it actually turned out to be bankers. Which, you know, bankers, terrorists, there's not much difference, I'll grant you. But it's an important distinction. So, remember that too, because that's important. That's as important as Sayyid Malikpur. So, again, a mass digression here. We're going to be talking about Zoroastrian theology. You never thought you'd see that in a fucking security talk, did you? Now, Angramenu is basically the Persian representative of evil. He's basically Satan for Persia. And translated roughly, Angramenu means disruptive spirit, which I thought would be a good name for a project that we've been working on, which is what I'm talking about now. Now, as well as Angramenu, there's this dude called Zahak. Now, Zahak was cool, because what he did is he made a deal with the devil, killed his old man, and then grew snakes on his shoulders, because that's what happens when you make a deal with the devil, and ruled Iran for a thousand years with the help of demons, which is pretty cool. And it's phase one of Project Angramania. So, now you know a little bit more about Zoroastrian theology. Again, a first for a security talk. I'm pretty, pretty confident of that. Um, Zahak is our first foray into doing something entertaining. And um, what we decided to do was port scan an entire fucking country. Because, why not? Um, why? Because science, as well as various other things that I'll, I'll discuss later. Now, we're not the first to do this. The Lander study did it and did the entire internet because it's Department of Homeland Security and they can do things like that. And they found millions and millions of hosts. Karna did it in 2012, that wasn't the DHS, and they built a botnet, which you know the DHS would never ever do, and they found lots more IPs. Let's not forget Shodan, that does it. Uh, Critical IO does it, but for 18 ports, and doesn't do it anymore because HD more got told off. But my favorite bit of port scanning news was in 2008. A guy called Donald Burleson, who I've never fucking heard of, described David Litchfield, who's a really good security researcher. If you have Oracle, if you have MySQL, if you have any fucking database, you'll know who David Litchfield is, or should. Yeah? Well, Dave scanned, what, um, 1, 1 million hosts, and found about half of those, about half a million hosts, had internet-facing DBs, many of which didn't have auth. Now, this pissed off David Burleson because apparently David broke the Computer Misuse Act by port scanning. And as each offense was worth six months, Burleson's claim was that Dave could do 240,000 years in jail, which is quite a long time, I think. Now, there's two words to describe that, namely, you're wrong, and secondly, fuck off, <laughs> because you're wrong, and maybe should understand law. Just an idea. So, prosecution is possible under both the CFFA and the Computer Misuse Act in the UK. But it all comes down to intent. Now, if there's no criminal intent to breach discovered systems that you find, I'd argue there's no crime. I'd argue it's incredibly bad internet manners, and I'd argue that it's potentially morally dubious, but I'm a bad-mannered, morally dubious kind of guy, so I don't really fucking care, because I can't go to jail for being bad-mannered, which is good. So, need to stress, I am not a lawyer. This is why, you know, I can stand here and give this talk instead of charging you people about $500 an hour for the privilege. Uh, but just to make sure that we weren't breaching the law, we basically played cyberpunk. So what we did is we bought a VPS from El Patel over in Holland. And we did that from an anonymous Russian email address and we paid in Bitcoin. Um, even if we'd not gone to that extent, which was like something out of a William Gibson novel, port scanning in Holland is legal. We scanned from Holland, therefore legal. Fuck you. Ha! <laughs> Also, Elcatel don't actually care. Uh, interesting thing about Elcatel is basically there's some links between Elcatel as a VPS host 
and Russian Business Network. If you've never heard of Russian Business Network, bulletproof hosting, not very nice people. And the box that we got access to, the box that we paid for using magical Bitcoin money, basically was fully loaded with malware that somebody had been running from that box. So Alcatel also don't clean up servers before renting them out again, which was fun to know. We got free shit. <laughs> Another thing we did, we were also very, very nice. Basically, we put up a banner explaining who we were, what we were doing, and if people wanted us to stop, to contact us, and we would immediately stop. Um, we made sure that was in English and Farsi and Persian, because nice. Uh, but nobody contacted us because we were very, very gentle. And what we did is we did one box and one port at a time. So did a box and a port, moved on to the next box and a port. And that's why we did a thousand of these, not 65,000, because otherwise we'd still be doing it when I'm about 80. And I'm not far off because I've just had a birthday. <sighs> so we scanned really slowly. The scan took between June and July. We put up an hour explaining who and what we were. We scanned from a country where it's legal. And we're doing this for science, not to breach systems. And we will share details if you ask nicely. But what we won't do is allow public access to this information so you people can do mad hacks of Iran and then blame me. Because fuck you guys, I know that's what you'll do. <laughs> also, an important distinction is that most of this data is out of date because data on the internet shifts. Systems change and go away. So the motivation of this, though, was to examine countrywide net blocks. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to get a picture of global risk and threat. That's why I'm wearing this fucking helmet. Because if there are Iranians here, they are going to fucking shoot me. So they'll have to not go for the head now. They'll have to go for a body shot, which means I might survive. So what I actually wanted to do was take a country as an illustrator, because if you take a country as an illustrator, you can apply it to your own country and hopefully improve things. And I wanted to use tools that are commonly available for people and not against them, because I'm not a dick. Talking about dicks, um, in August this year, um, news emerged about a project called Hacienda. In case you're wondering what that is, that's a Mancunian club called the Hacienda, which was the birthplace of house music in the UK. And thus, I am kind of pissed off at GCHQ and Five Eyes for stealing that name, because that was a cool venue, and they shouldn't steal names. Now, Hacienda scanned 27 countries um, using MMAP, which is a bit fucking insane, because they must have been doing this for years. And what they did is they shared details amongst Five Eyes members, so Australia, New Zealand, you guys, Canada, blah, blah, blah. And basically what they tried to build was a private showdown. Unlike us, however, they breached the law in quite a major way. Because what they did is if Hacienda found a particularly weak host, they turned it into an orb. Now, an orb, or an operational relay box, or our rooted boxes, is just what it sounds like. We have found a works at weak server. Let's take it over and use it as a jump in and pivot point. And that's a pretty shitty thing to do, because you're not determining strengths and weaknesses there. You're not just actually finding any detailed adversarial analysis. All you're doing is hacking shit, which, frankly, people get put in jail for. Unless, of course, it's the government, in which case, no jail for you. That's cool. But the point is, we were port scanning tubes before, publicly, GCHQ were. Therefore, we're cooler and we're more hipster than GCHQ. So, what did we look for? Well, we scanned you know, the, full of the, the whole of Iran, which is about 10 million hosts. All I have to say is thank fuck for, net, uh, thank fuck for mass scan, because otherwise we'd still be doing it. Um, we found about half a million hosts, or 4.3 active, 4 active million hosts, of which a million of them had banners. Uh, we checked for 1,000 ports, courtesy of MMAP and their top 1,000 ports. Thanks very much for that, guys. Saves a lot of effort. And we grabbed any banners that we could. What we didn't do is attempt any exploitation at all, because as say CFA, CMA, don't want to go to jail. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, in Iran, according to banners, and this is an important description, there's quite a lot of odd shit. However, the winning port by a mile, unsurprisingly enough, is port 80. Hooray, who'd have thought it? The internet wins. We have web services. Woohoo! There are some interesting points about that, though. Um, Iran has got a shit ton of tel telnet. It's got more telnet than SSH, which is odd, or just really shit practice, I'm not sure. There also appeared to be a lot of SIP, 
which again is really fucking strange. Um, in terms of common services that you typically expect to find on a network, SMTP, barely any hosts at all running SMTP. No mail in around, no mail for you. You want civil, you want civil liberties? No. You want email? No. Now, there's lots and lots of stuff that doesn't make sense. I mean, if we go back to this one, um, port 6789, which we reckon something to do with, with streaming. But what the fuck are the Iranians streaming that they need 160,000 things streaming? That's, that's a bit odd. Now, ports in and of themselves mean nothing. What we needed was banners, because banners tell us shit. Ports don't. Now, one thing that we did know is out of the scans that we did, about one and a half, about 154,000, give a bit, I'll have a basic auth. So to put it another way, that's 150,000 hosts that don't have any authentication for any credentials that are passed by HTTP. That's pretty shit. I mean, I don't know how it would compare with this country because we've not port scanned this country yet and we're not, probably not going to because we're scared. Um, in Iran, funnily enough, Microsoft IIS is the most popular web server. Microsoft are winning in Iran, which is important news. There are lots and lots of weird web servers in Iran. I mean, has anybody here actually heard of something called baby web server? Anyone? Raise a hand. Yeah, that's, a, that's how we reacted to that too. Namely, what the fuck is this? There's about 10,000 of them. And we did some checking and baby web servers like ridiculously insecure. You just look at it and goes, no, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but there's 10,000 of those, which is pretty cool. Um, of the four most popular Apache, Microsoft, Nginx, like TBD, there's only about 22,000 hosts, which out of nine and a half million is fuck all. It's weird. So, how do they break down? Microsoft wins by a long margin. And in terms of Nginx, poor old Nginx, out of a country of nearly 10 million hosts, only has 230 boxes. That's bad market penetration, even by my standards. In terms of versions of IE, Unsurprisingly enough, the most popular version of IE is 7.5. However, the interesting thing to know about this is in Iran, there is one IS3 box. They are running IS3 in Iran. We were baffled by this. I mean, why the fuck would you do this? Are you insane? Have you forgotten your medication? Do you know where you are and what you are called? And then we did some checking and discovered it belongs to a university. And then it made sense. Because it proved that universities globally are insane. Which is nice to know. It's a, it's a thing that binds us, I think. In terms of Apache, 2.23 uh, wins, which, you know, is not si that surprising because it's probably the most stable. And, but, you know, there was a version of 2.4 which, you know, is only 12 years out of date, that'll be fine. Put that on the internet. It's great. Don't worry about it. Everything will be good. In terms of engines, 1.41 wins, sell surprise. But, you know, you have engines 1 there, which is a little bit out of date, but not as out of date as the others. So well done, guys. Like TPD, unsurprisingly, 1.428. Big whoop. Now, this is an interesting bit. One fascinating thing was Allegro Soft ROM Pager. If you don't know what Allegro Soft ROM Pager is, I didn't. Um, basically what it is, it's a web server for embedded services. So it's commonly found on routers. You also find it on lots of control systems, which is a bit weird. And um, ROM Pager is used more often in Iran than anything else. Now, if you wanted to be a dick, and you know, some of you may want to be dicks, I don't know. There are 150,000 hosts in Iran that if you send that request to, will die. <laughs> you can basically do a denial of service using a crap buffer overflow and it will kill all versions of Allegro Soft ROM Pager, which is pretty shit. So, you have a remote unauthenticated denial of service. So that's 150,000 routers or embedded devices in Iran that go bye-bye. That's pretty shit. However, it's not the shittiest thing. As I say, there's about 150,000 hosts running various versions of ROM Pager in Iran. Now, that's 150,000 hosts that are vulnerable to a denial of service attack, completely unauthenticated, by the way. Um, but they're also vulnerable to other shit. If you make a simple HTTP request 
to the host, forward slash ROM0, it dumps out the ROM file. If you have the ROM file, you can decrypt the ROM file. If you can decrypt the ROM file, you can get the credentials. If you can get the credentials, you own the embedded server of 150,000 boxes. So my logic is, why do a denial of service against 150,000 hosts if you can own them? Fuck you, GCHQ. If we're going to play operational relay boxes, I could potentially get 150,000 of them. I win. <laughs> to prove the point, we wrote a little tool called Justice Sword because we're naming, using the same naming conventions as GCHQ and the NSA. Because if they can play that game, I'm playing that game too. And as you can see, point at a local host, because we're not doing this to Iran, because fuck you, I'm not going to jail, because I'm too pretty. <laughs> but it works. That was a fucking hint, by the way. Well done for missing it. <laughs> so, one thing we noted was that our result set was very, very different from Shoda. Very different. Um, why is that? Well, if you were to search for Cisco CP, which doesn't stand for Cisco Child Pornography, I learned. I thought it might, but it didn't. We only found 76 records of that in our set. In June, Shodan had 300 plus. In August, that was down to 176. And this proves my point about data being transient. Data moves. Systems change. They become other things. But why is Cisco CP bad? Well, if you don't know about it, what happens is you connect to the box and it says, hi, use the username Cisco and the password Cisco. Don't worry about it. It'll be cool. That's pretty shit. Shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. So, Stuxnet. Hilarious stuff. We all like Stuxnet. It was made by little magic elves and Israelis. And so what we did is we searched for SCADA-specific ports. And we didn't find that much, you know, because SCADA and Iran kind of worried about SCADA for some reason now. Don't know why. Um, so there was, there was stuff there, but not much. One interesting resource I did find, however, was a presentation by an Iranian engineering student. And he detailed all the power plants in Tehran which is incredibly brave or insane. And I'm not going to name the guy because I don't want to get him shot. And I think if they found out, he'd get shot. Because it literally is, this is a technical specification of this power plant. This is a technical specification of this power plant. It's just like, oh my fucking God, why is that on the internet? <laughs> now, I'm not going to provide a link to it. And I'm not going to name him because, as I say, I don't want the guy shot because I thought it was excellent. <laughs> now, how did people, Iranians or elves or Sorry, Israelis or elves. Iranians, Israelis, same thing, really. How did they know to go after Siemens? Because this guy, very handily, put in little diagrams of all the systems, Siemens systems that were in use in Iran. One thing that Stuxnet missed, however, was Gauss Core SA. Gauss Core SA, if you don't know them, are basically a Spanish control system manufacturer. So basically, you've got Spanish systems in use in Iran, which is pretty shit because I'm pretty sure there's export bans. But, you know, they're Spanish, so they don't care. But Gauss Core is probably an easier target than Siemens because Siemens are a bit worried about this shit now. And Gauss Core probably aren't. So, this is the guy's presentation. So you can see, here is Basat power plant. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, is in the near southeast of Tehran, blah, 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 blah. And it's fact, fact full of fascinating detail. And so what that allowed us to do was actually do a keyword search on our DB and actually find Basat boxes. And, you know, there's lots and lots of FTP associated with these guys. And if you were a dick, you could brute force that. But we're not going to brute force that because we're not dicks and we didn't break the law. We're doing this for science. Another thing we found was over a 1,000 in instances of Mercury 800. Mercury 800, if you don't know about them, basically they're made by Tainet, who are a tiny little distributor. And they basically sit in front of your PBX and do all the call logging and monitoring. So you can basically log into these boxes if you wanted to be an arse, possibly using default credentials, because why the fuck would that be on the public internet if you're not using default credentials? And you could probably listen to Iranian conversations, which I'm sure would be fascinating if you speak Iranian or were prepared to break the law. I can't do either, so I don't know. Um, we also searched for SCADA stuff by vendor. So, you know, the usual Susworks, Rockwell, Wonderware, blah, 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 blah. Nothing. A vast, desolate, fucking desert of SCADA, which disappointed us greatly. Uh, we found one instance of Niagara, 
which was funny enough an FTP server, which was with an Iranian VPS company. You can buy a VPS in Iran. I'm buying a VPS in Iran. <laughs> I don't know why, I just want one. We also found three instances of Linnell. Linnell, again, SCADA manufacturer, but those turned out to be cyber-owned firewalls, which are not SCADA. That had a light. So what we did is we did keyword searches for the usual suspects. So, you know, water, that's important, mod bus, blah, 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 field bus, etc. And we found fucking nothing. I mean, nothing. No pretty interfaces everywhere. And we were most, most unhappy about that, as you can well imagine. We also searched for, you know, the <laughs> conventional terms, Navy, military, guide, guide, no guidance systems in Iran. Boo! Um, but we did find a couple of instances of military, e.g. mail servers that were running an old version of XSIM, but we didn't find any mention of jihad, which I think is moderately reassuring on a global scale. We also searched for keywords like hacker, because that's fun. And this is an actual screenshot of a rooted box in Iran, which is either insanely brave or massively suicidal, I'm not sure which. Don't fuck with the Iranians, because they have, like, death squads and shit. Um, but we also found um, a resource belonging to Persian hackers, um, which was associated with that email address there. Yes, Persian hackers use Yahoo, ladies and gentlemen. They're that leet. So what we did, because we're dicks, is we looked up his email address and we found him. So first-rate Iranian opsack there. Say hello to the world. You're now famous, Persian hacker man. You're famous. Now... Um, last year, FireEye, who are sponsoring this, so I have to be moderately gentle on them, um, published a report called Operation Saffron Rose. Now, what happened there is they found in a Facebook group associated with Iran, or Iranian hackers, and they said, the Iranian hackers are coming, APT, APT, bolt, 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 the, bolt the windows and be very afraid. Now, we did some keyword searching for the terms they use, so Ajax Security Team, Ajax TM, Carex, Cots Freedom, found fucking nothing. Nothing publicly advertised. That doesn't mean they don't exist, it just means that we couldn't find them. One interesting thing about that, though, is the Ajax security team has got an interesting name. If you know your history, you know this bit. In 1953, um, the CIA basically had a coup in Iran. It was their first real coup. It was exciting for them because they were coup versions. Now what happened there is a guy called Mohammed Mossadegh got elected, democratically, people were voting, amazing. And he wanted to nationalize the oil pipelines in Iran because Iranian oil. And weirdly, that pissed off the British because we bought all the Iranian oil for about 20p in a bag of rice. And because it pissed us off, we told you and it pissed you off. And you sent in the CIA and you deposed a democratically elected leader and replaced him with the Shah of Iran. Now, the Shah of Iran went around killing everyone who wasn't the Shah of Iran or the Shah of Iran's family. And weirdly, Iranians got pissed off about this. So what they did is they put an Ayatollah Khomeini, who was a radical Muslim cleric. And then the entire Middle East went to shit. So well done, CIA. But the interesting thing about that was that that project, or that coup, was called Operation Ajax. Now apparently there's an Ajax security team operating out of Tehran. Maybe the two are linked. I don't know. I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat. I'm wearing a fucking helmet. You work it out. Another thing we found, in terms of straight shot web banners, lots of those, about 29 of those, which is kind of shit. <laughs> Please log into the box using these credentials. Uh, no. <laughs> so tempting, though, so tempting. Now, in terms of keywords, we also searched for things like whiskey, and weirdly, it would be in Iran, we found no whiskey, which I found most disappointing. So, brings me on to the second part of my talk mainly detailing why Gamma Group do more than FinFisher, or FinSpy, or whatever you want to call it these days. So, one common complaint about intelligence agencies is that they listen to phone calls. Who'd have thought that intelligence groups like to gather intelligence? I'd never have perceived that. Now, they can either do this via physical taps or network taps. I mean, ask Mitnick, he apparently was the master of physical tapping, allegedly. And with the use of cellular comms, Law enforcement and intel agencies now use IMSI catchers. IMSI catchers are used a lot, and I mean a lot. So what is an IMSI catcher? Well, it's a magical device that basically performs man in the middle, 
and seeks to gain access to the International Mobile Security Identifier associated with the phone and the subscriber um, information for that phone. And it also goes after the EMEA, which is the mobile equipment identifier, so basically the handset serial number. So you've got the code that's associated with the SIM card, so uh, the code that's associated with the handset. Therefore, you can track a suspect anywhere you want because you know who they are. Now, it typically operates as a small base transceiver, which um, is used purely to identify the embassy catcher and intercept calls, even though they said that they don't intercept calls from Canada. So, IMSI catchers are used to monitor for very specific communications. E.g., drug dealer X phones drug dealer Y and arranges to buy quantity of drugs from location Q. Unfortunately, because it's, a base, it's effectively a transceiver and intercepts baseband traffic, it goes across band. And what you do is you get non-suspect calls. E.g., not drug dealer A, you know, person B, who's not a drug dealer, which is a minor problem. Now, if you stick up an NC catcher between, as a, and to impersonate a legitimate base station, um, what you can effectively do is degrade the GSM encryption that's in, work, that's in place, if indeed any is. In places like Iran, they don't have GSM encryption because, you know, fuck you and your secrets. And, as you would expect, the NSA have them. I mean, if you read the Ant catalog, you can buy an MC catcher for $250,000. Cheap, huh? But be careful how you use it because, as they state here, operational restrictions exist for equipment deployment. No, they fucking don't. Don't lie. You say, can I have an MC catcher? They say, yes, you can have an MC catcher. Don't listen to the president. I'm not wanting to listen to the president. I'm wanting to listen to the state of Wyoming. That's fine. The president isn't there. If you work in law enforcement, you can buy a Stingray. Stingrays cost about 60 grand. It's the cheapest one that I've ever found. What do they do? Same as the NSA one, but it don't cost 250 grand because they ain't government. Now, allegedly, Stingrays and MC catchers per se are only used to triangulate position. That's what it's there to do. Law enforcement would never do warrantless surveillance, would they? They'd never click the little button that says, listen to call, you know, the clearly marked one. That would never happen, because that would be wrong. Intelligence agencies would definitely, definitely never do warrantless wiretaps, would they? I mean, probably. You're not going to get, you're not going to get some dude in Quantico going, hmm, I wonder what that button says, and that button does. Let's find out. <coughs> um, so, what we wanted to do is, because they have MC captures, we wanted an MC capture. Because I, I want one. They can have one. I want one. It's only fair. And we're not the first to look at building one. Uh, DEFCON 18, Chris in Paget did, built one using antennas and everything and electronics and was awesome. I mean, I used to work with Chris in and amazing engineer. Like, intensely good at electrical engineering and all the shit. Now, unfortunately, it took about $1,500 to work. And quite frankly, there's no way I could replicate it because I'm retarded and don't know how to solder properly. And, you know, if I tried to set up an antenna, I'd probably set a building on fire. So there has to be an easy way to do it. Thankfully, there is. Um, there's something called Osmo Com BB, open source mobile comms and baseband. And that's basically free firmware for certain baseband processor chipsets. In CCC, a um, guy called Kristen Knoll and Sylvain Minot demonstrated how you could turn a handset that was running Osmo Com BB into a handy GSM sniffer. Ooh, that'll work. Earlier this year, a guy called Hacker Fantastic, which is a great name, and you have to admire the ego on it, if nothing else, uh, demoed, demoed his MC Catcher, which is kind of a similar idea, but for Android, at uh, EMF camp in the UK, which was annoying because it basically beat us to the punch, which was kind of shit, uh, but never mind. Um, now, I'm Curious Yellow, which I will explain the naming later, yeah, steals other people's ideas and makes them ours. Because that's what I do. Because fuck thinking of things myself, I'll just steal them and make them better. Now, the design is a simple one. Thus, it's really, really cheap to do. Basically, what you have is you have a, you have a GSM transe transceiver to do all the radio shit, and you've got a control unit. That's all you need. That's pretty much it. So you basically only need two primary components. 
What do you need? You need a Motorola phone. Uh, those run Osmo Combi B quite happily. Um, you can try and find a C123 that I do know a supplier. He will charge you about $100. Or you can go on eBay and get a C115, which will do the same sort of job for about $10, $15. One of the things we're giving away is, is um, a Motorola series, series phone that will run Osmo Combi B. So you don't have to source it. You just have to apply to a competition and maybe drink some vodka. Now, well, what you do with that Motorola phone is you stick Osmo Combi B on it. And basically what that will do is it will act as a transceiver, it will find the weakest tower around, or the weakest cell tower around, and it will clone the signal. And as I say, they're a pain to source, but they can be found. Version 1 of I Am Curious Yellow, which we worked on, runs Ubuntu, a couple of elite. And basically what, what, that, what that does is um, the base unit has Asmo Combi B on it, and OpenBTS running in front. Now, OpenBTS uses a comms layer of Osmo ComBB, and that allows you to set up the transceiver from the phone and interpret the results. So basically what you've got is you've got very quick and dirty MC catching for all. Now, it's important that I stress that this is for MC catching, and I'll tell you why later. So, a number of very significant limitations. It cannot intercept calls yet. Um, we're, stick, we're trying to stick asterisks on there and get asterisks to do the call interception. However, if we do that, that's incredibly legally questionable. Um, the range currently is shit. We've got an antenna that boosts it up a bit, but we're trying to work on the actual build of that so it's actually reliable and shit. And that's why we're looking at signal amplification and really interesting things like that. And as I said earlier, it can only intercept EMEAs and IMSIs, which is what law enforcement say they do. So if that's all they want to do, we can build them one of that. We can build them a unit that does that, and it'll cost them fuck all money. Or they can spend 750 grand on one. Their choice. Also, interesting thing to note is under UK law, and probably under CFFA, under the audits, or audits of the C CFFA, this shit is utterly illegal to use. We tested ours in a Faraday cage. We went to a local university and said, please can we sit in your special room? And they said, okay. And we said, thank you, because we've not got a Faraday cage because they're hard to build, because I can't afford as much tinfoil as they can. Now, it has got a number of advantages. Anyone can have an IMSI catcher. You can have an IMSI catcher, you can have an IMSI catcher. Fuck it, I can have an IMSI catcher. That's even more fucking worrying. It doesn't cost as much as a house. 750 grand will buy your house or an IMSI catcher. Doesn't cost as much as a car. A decent car will cost you $60,000. So will a Stingray. Fuck it. Um, so our total production costs for I Am Curious Yellow were 250 bucks, which was $20 for the phone, $200, $200 for the laptop, and about $20 for the cable construction to you know, make the laptop and the mobile phone talk to each other. Now, some of you are going to be curious about the name. And I chose the name strategically. I'm Curious Yellow is the name of a Swedish art film from 1967. Now, it got into a lot of trouble, and it got banned for a while because it showed a flaccid cock, which apparently was a very big deal in 1967 because people were scared of penises. Possibly it was all the acid. I don't know. But penises were a scary thing in 1967. But the US Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the decision from Massachusetts, you know, go, go, Boston, and it was really important in terms of history of state censorship, which is why we stole the, net, we stole the name. It also allowed me to use the word, phrase penis on stage, which as a moderately you know, mature and reasonable individual, I don't find at all entertaining. Penis, penis, penis. So, earlier this year, or sorry, earlier last year, news war broke of a body-worn IMSI capture available from Gamma Group. Gamma Group are lovely people, I'll talk about them more, but you can learn about their body-worn MC catcher there. Public information now, take that Gamma Group. That particular data sheet is full of the world's best quotes. If you don't, haven't already read it, download it, read it. It's fucking hilarious. For example, my favourite is quote, or one of them, because there are many, is cellular networks have created a haven for criminals and terrorists. What? Are you mildly insane? No, they haven't. They've enabled global communication. 
They're not just used by criminals and terrorists. You probably have one gamma group. In fact, you probably have a decent phone bill. But there you go. If you use a phone, you're a criminal or a terrorist. Now, this is the body one MC catcher in question. What you have there is a body vest and lots of components. And this is the environment you're obviously meant to use it in, which is a shopping mall. Possibly it's for Dawn of the Dead, I don't know. But basically what you've there, got there is a body vest that looks like you're vaguely pregnant, which isn't necessarily the best look for a fella. I mean, I look vaguely pregnant, but mine's beer related, so I've got a fucking good excuse. Now, if it's anything like Finn Spy or Finn Fisher or whatever calling it this week, Gamma Group are going to let anybody use their MC catchers. They don't give a flying fuck. Why do I say that? Well, Reporters Without Borders um, declared Gamma Group one of the, enemy, the corporate enemies of the internet. Why? Because they sell surveillance technologies to anyone. You're having problems with dissidents demanding human rights? Fuck it, buy some surveillance gear. It'll be good, you can buy a jag and you can get rid of a the problem. They're not very nice people. Now, disregarding politics, which is very hard for me to do, their body-worn design sucks. And if it's anything like Finn Fisher, they're going to overcharge for it. So they're going to overcharge for that, which is rubbish. I don't want to look pregnant. Now, using the same technology behind I Am Curious Yellow, we made a body-worn version called I Am Curious Blue. Yeah, now, it's less cumbersome. It's got a shitty range on it. And I mean shit range. I think most we amped it up to about eight inches. It's really bad. Um, but the thing about that is if you're doing a protest, you have to look into the face of the people that you're surveilling. And maybe you'll get some fucking guilt then and grow a fucking conscience. I don't know. It might happen. Now, how did we do it? Well, we got a battery-powered Raspberry Pi. We put Open BTS on it. And we put Osmo Cum BB on it to act as a control unit. We got a Motorola handset and set that up as uh, the transceiver. It's got the same limitations and advantages of I'm Curious Yellow, but much less cost. You can buy a phone for 10 bucks, you can buy a cable for 20, you can buy a Raspberry Pi for 25, you're done. You've got an MC Capture that's your very own for less than $100, which I think is slightly less than $750,000. I mean, it could be wrong, but I think it is. Now, in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, which you probably are, that goes in that pocket, or on the floor, the cable goes around the back, and the phone, if I can find the fucking thing, goes up. Tiny, tiny form factor, and the nice thing is, you look smart. You turn up to protest looking dapper in your formal wear. The name comes from I'm Curious Blue, which is the second part of I'm Curious Yellow. That was released in 68 and didn't get into legal trouble because it didn't have any cock in it. So, yeah. Now, our plan, eventually, is to put I'm Curious Yellow on a 512K Panasonic Toughbook. Why? Because I'm possibly insane. And I think that would be an entertaining thing to do. Also, we got a Toughbook and we sprayed it yellow. So now we have to use it. Because I've already sprayed it yellow. And we're also, as I said earlier, considering doing some lo-fi call intercepts using asterisks. Now, the thing about that is I'm having a hard time justifying that legally to myself, and my lawyer's having an even harder time justifying it legally, because obviously if I actually ever demo that, I, you know, break the law. Now, that brings me to my, my second point. Where the fuck is this shit, Mike? Where is the magical MC catcher? Well, I'm aware of the CFFA. I'm aware of the Federal Communications Agency. You probably wouldn't be happy about me using the GSM band. I'm definitely aware of the TSA, who took a very close interest in what I was bringing with me this year, to the point of, what is this? It is a phone. Why do you have a phone? To make phone calls. Why do you have several phones? I need to make many phone calls. <laughs> Hello, this is Iron Geek here. Unfortunately, we had a small video glitch here, where one of the capture devices crashed. So the next minute or so is going to be without audio but it starts up again very shortly.
<coughs> Sorry about that, future customers, but he is a good guy. But yeah, he went mad doing this, and you can probably see why. There was much swearing, which is quite cute in an Irish accent, because all I could hear for like half a day was, feck, fecking thing, fecking thing doesn't fecking work for a day, or at least half a day anyway. So we also needed power. So because we're lo-fi, we went to the local shops, and we bought a, mo a mobile phone battery charger, which is crap, because the battery life on that will be rubbish. But, you know, it's fine, because we got to disassemble a mobile phone battery charger. And we also needed to communicate. So rather than using wireless, because fuck that, everybody can find wireless now, because people know what a rogue AP is now, we use Tor, because funny. And we just set up head in the service on the Pi to allow the Pi to talk to the outside world. Now, that basically allowed the phone and the Pi to operate without conflict, because basically the Pi was a switch. And it said, do you want to make a phone call? Yes, use the phone. Do you want to actually allow people's access to your network? Yeah, go on, why the fuck not? Use the Tor head in the service. So, basically, double sandwich, it's got independent power, and you can't detect it through checking voltage, which is one way to detect an implant. Um, it's accessible via a Tor hidden service, and Tor will probably go through most corporate firewalls. You won't know it's there, because it isn't there. Fuck you and your IPv4. We've, we've got onion routing. <laughs> now, as I say, it acts as a switch, so both the Pi and the host device can operate as expected by both the user, who's like, hello, Janice Accounts, and the attacker, who's like, hello, Janice and Accounts Computer, what's on your network? Now, interesting thing about this is the entire build took a week from start to finish. There was lots of Irish swearing in the interim of that week, but it took a week. And in that week, we basically went from having, we went to having a fully functional VoIP phone with a data exfiltration device built in. And we started this with fuck all knowledge. This was another one of my great ideas of, lads, why don't we? And then the people around me went, why don't we, Mike? Because you're insane. And I went, no, I'm not. You're just done. Make it work. And then I went to the pub, because that's what I do these days. Now, the only physical signs that anything's there, unless you can find the hidden service, are weight and a non-discoverable service. If you want the schematics, you can have them. They're yours. Take them. Enjoy setting up your own parasitic network devices using a Pi. I think it's good. But yeah, if you want, take, ask. Now, bad USB. You're all familiar with bad USB, undoubtedly. Um, the Ant catalog is a lot of fun. And we're not alone in thinking so. Cotton Mouth basically was a USB rubber ducky on crack, but for USB connections. So, fuck you, auto start. We don't need you anymore. We're just going to put this in and run shit. And we started our, work, our version of that in June, which is an important date. Because in August, two guys from SR Labs dropped their version. So basically, I'd been, we'd been at this for a month, or I'd been at this for a month, because this was my side project that was pissing around with myself. Um, because SR Labs took a long time to release this, because they were trying to be good, uh, a couple of guys at DarbyCon, who I'm sure some of you were there, dropped the actual code that they reverse engineered from the actual USB hardware device. Now, I salute them all, especially Cordell and Wilson, who did the decompilation, kind of screwed SR Labs, but they kind of served them out right because it took too long to drop. But I did waste it's about two months of my life, which pisses me off a little bit, but, you know, my life is waste anyway. Now, if you don't already have it, you can go and get the code. I'm sure you already do. Um, you will need to get a Patriot 8-gigabyte supersonic express drive. Um, now, I suspect they're going to sell out. I've had them on back order for two months, and they've still not arrived. I was planning to bring some with me to give them away. However, Retailer X, who shall not be named, fucked me on this, which kind of sucks. And as I say, did still waste two months of my life, but it did get us thinking. So we did a project called Strip Mine. Now, the iron key from Imation is a serious drive for safeguarding serious data and is serious business. That's why they use the word serious a lot, because it's serious. They're not pissing around, this is serious. Now, it's level 3 FIPS compliant, and that basically means it's been lab tested. Somebody's gone, yep, this is a 9K. Yeah, that's good. Marvellous. Thanks, guys. And basically, <laughs> the best bit about this is that NIST, National Institute of Standards, have certified the integrity of not just the crypto chip that stood all the encryption within an iron key, but also all the components that are in it. All of them. Now, um, iron key done well. They're fixed compliant. Well done, guys. Awesome. 
Um, if you don't know what IAN key does, it basically encrypts data using AS256, using MC56 hash, surprisingly enough. Another interesting factoid about the IAN key is the National Bureau of Communication and Security in Holland have confirmed that the IAN key is suitable for carrying state secrets on. So the Dutch said, the IAN key is that secure, we can carry state secrets on this with utter impunity. Now, it's also dust proof and waterproof, because the military tested it by dropping it a pond and then driving a tank over it, probably, because that's what them do. And the an interesting bit that nobody really knows about, well, some people do, is that before Iron Key was Imation, it used to be the uh, Homeland Security guys. And Homeland Security said, here, have a million and a half dollars, invent something cool. And then Imation said, oh, that's cool, let's sell that. Now, as I alluded to earlier, Iron Keys have got crypto in them. That's how they work. Yeah? They can be remotely managed and turned off and turned on. They've got tamper-resistant metal housing, which for me is a bit of a red flag. How tamper-resistant is tamper-resistant? Does tamper-resistant mean resistant to tampering? So, we purchased a second-hand one from eBay, which is the source of all our research projects because we are poor. That is why we're here. That is why we have a stand. Give us money, then we won't be poor, and then we can buy proper shit, and I can present proper research that doesn't involve going to eBay every five fucking minutes. Now, we attacked the Iron Key with a Dremel to see what was inside, because, you know, you get a new device, attack it with a Dremel, what lives within? We then decided that the actual Iron Key was made of adamantium, which pissed us off a lot. We got quite annoyed at Wolverine, but not quite as annoyed as Stan Lee, who looks deeply, deeply scared. I can understand why, but he... Stanley's thinking about nice thoughts in that picture, I think. And I can well understand why, to be fair. Now, we have access to an industrial angle grinder. If you see in photo A, the little tiny dent is what the Dremel did, and it burnt out the Dremel. So, fuck you, adamantium. Uh, the second photo is basically the iron key um, on a voice, about to be you know, introduced to our angle grinder. Um, which we did, and fuck you, metal housing, because we have angle grinder. And um, we're down to the epoxy. So what we learned is that tamper resistant does not beat angle grinder. Angle grinder wins. <laughs> angle grinder is serious business. Now, the question is, how the fuck do we get the epoxy off there? Do we use fire? Do we use prayer? Do we use dragons? Dragons would be cool. Where can we get dragons? Oh, they don't sell them on eBay. Shit. Now, what we did do is we, and on staff, we've got InfoDocs, otherwise known as Darren Martin, who's awesome because he's a chemist. He does chemistry and shit. It's great. We've got actual scientists, not just guys pretending to be scientists. We have a real one. And we used nitric acid. If you don't know, nitric acid is a precursor for explosives. And we found a supplier to sell as a precursor for explosives. Us. They sold us a precursor. Are they fucking high? What's going to happen to the acid? Mm. Now, we're on more watch list now, but I don't care. Now, the thing about the nitric acid is it's going to fuck up the PCB, but we don't care. We wanted the chipset. I don't care about the, I don't care about the PCB at all, because I wanted to see how the chipset worked. Fun facts. Five days to the day after we bought the nitric acid, the UK government introduced licenses for, for precursors. Five days. Because licenses, as I'm sure you're all aware, stop terrorists. Terrorists are fucking terrified of paperwork. <laughs> now, had we purchased this precursor agent five days later, we'd be looking at a jail sentence of two years. So I'm extraordinarily glad we didn't actually, you know, do that. We got by by the skin of our teeth, and now we've got nitric acid, and we can store it until 2016, and that's perfectly legal. We just, you know, can't buy any more, which is a shame because, you know, we may apply for a license though, just to see if we get one, which we probably won't. So, this is science happening. What you have here is you've got a cold acid bath of the iron key, followed by a warm acid bath of the iron key. See how inventive we were. And we used a hot plate, which we had to buy, which was great, and we had to buy beakers and nitric acid, and yeah, we're on watch lists. No, I didn't. I actually went to I actually went to a hardware store and used cash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So after a couple of hours, hours of science, we're down, the epoxy, the rugged, ruggedized epoxy is most, mostly melted away, which is good. And after a few more hours and heat and chemistry and science, actual fucking science, not pretend computer science, we're down to the board. And after a few more hours, we have the chips, the glorious, glorious iron key chips, including the crypto chip. Now, as highlighted, we're very lucky we've got a material science on, a scientist on staff. And he's still going through university at the moment, which means we've got access to a scanning electron microscope. No other security company has got a scanning electron microscope. So fuck you all if you think you're doing science. We've got a SEM and nitric acid and precursors and watch lists. Now, what do the chips look like under a SEM? Well, <laughs> funny story. Two days ago, we were meant to be using the SEM to scan the chip, so I would have nice, pretty pictures to show you, and you could see the logic gate, and I could go, look, there's a logic gate. Ha ha, aren't I clever? Unfortunately, fourth-year physics students fucked the SEM. Now, if you don't know how much a, scan a scanning electron microscope costs, it's about, you can get a cheap one, and cheap, for about a million and a half pounds. So about $10 million. I don't know how it works out now anymore. <laughs> But a fourth year physics student has fucked it. He has broken it. He was the guy that used it before Darren got there and fucked it. So he's shitting himself right now. Now, they are getting engineers on site because they can't do it themselves because it's a fucking SEM. It's the size of a small house and it does chemistry and shit. And we'll be getting some pictures soon. If you want them, watch our blog because I will be no annoying the shit out of iMersion by going, yeah, see your temper resistant stuff. See your super secret crypto chip. It's on the line now, sorry. <laughs> Angle grinder and nitric acid, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be up hopefully in the next week or so. Um, same deal with the flash memory because we were going to scan that as well just to see what was there. And that said, we do have a couple of observations already. We learned that science, real science involving chemicals, beats tamper resistance. We also learned that flash memory is made by Samsung. Samsung, if you don't know them, are a Taiwanese company that do chip production in China. So the chips, or at least the flash memory in an, in an iMersion iron key, is made in fucking China. And that's fine, because China would never put anything on that, on that chip, would they? That would never happen. That will be fine. At least according to NIST, anyway. Now, why did we do this? Because funny is why. Tell me it's tamper resistant. Fuck you, I've got an angle grinder. Now, another reason we did it is we can scale back the acidic reaction. We now know that nitric acid works. So what we're going to use is we're going to use a dilute, and then hopefully we'll get to the PC board in, PCB board intact. And if we can do that, we can probably go after the crypto chip, which will be fun, because I know fuck all about encryption, so guess what my staff are learning about? Sorry, Ian. <laughs> um, if we can understand the hardware, what goes into an iron key, then we can go after the software, which will probably be version 2 if we don't get shot. Now, I'd like to end with an epilogue, because I'm rapidly running out of time. Oh shit, I am as well. Um, so, various agencies and private companies are doing very bad things. At the start of this talk, I told you to remember Saeed Malikpour. Did anybody here do that? No, nobody. Good. That means you're all drunk. Brilliant. Now, Saeed Malikpour is the same age as me. He's an Iranian dude funnily enough with that name, uh, that basically went to study um, engineering in Canada. Now, before he went to study engineering, because he was a software engineer, the Iranian government approached him and said, do you want to work on our nuclear program? He said, no, I want to make healthcare systems because that helps people rather than killing them. So he fucked off to Canada and he did his masters. And whilst he was in Canada, he re rented a couple of VPSs. And then he went back to Iran, because he'd finished in Canada, got his master's. And the Iranian government said, are you sure you don't want to work, don't want to work on a nuclear program? He said, no, I've got a job at a hospital. I'm quite happy, thank you. thank you. So the Iranian government did some checking. And the VPSs that he'd rented and then left, because, you know, he'd finished in Canada, they rented them to somebody else. Those VPSs were now being used to host Paul. And so the Iranian government arrested Saeed Malik Paul, put him in jail, and sentenced him to death because a VPS that he used to own was being used to host Paul. Now, obviously, Amnesty International, you're not getting away from politics that fucking far, you bastards, said that that was a bit shitty. So the Iranian government deferred his sentence to only life imprisonment. So there's a guy who's my age, 
who's a software engineer like some of you guys that's in jail in Iran forever for renting a VPS. That's pretty shit. Now, coming back to the very bad things, the bad things are being made for profit and they're being used in all manner of irresponsible ways, like listening to you or phone calls. Now, as technologists, technologists, wanky phrase, arseholes with computers might be a better way of putting it, we need to understand how these bad things work and we need to make them too. And as researchers, we definitely need to know how shit works. And as reasonable human beings, we have to let people know how they work and give them the tools. That's what the homebrew MC catch is about. That's what all of this shit's about. I may shouldn't say their shit's, their shit's uber secure and tamper resistant. No, it isn't. Fuck you, see? That's what we should be doing. Because if not, we might as well be in fucking jail with Saeed. Now, is this talk massively irresponsible? Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm doing it. Is warrantless surveillance acceptable? No. Is actually physically hacking other companies legal? Hell no. Is it acceptable? Hell no. Should your government and my government be support scanning countries around the world and owning shit in those countries? No. What possible fucking justification is there for that? Final quote, and you may have noticed there is a strong Game of Thrones theme throughout this because I was watching the entire four series before I did this talk and it may have brainwashed me a little bit. It's a very fucking suggestible. Give me honourable enemies rather than ambitious ones and I'll sleep more easily at night. And I think that applies to our government agencies. They need to be responsible and honourable rather than ambitious. Because if they want to build toys, I'm going to build toys. If I want to build toys, you should all build toys too. So, quick wrap up. I'd like to thank everybody involved in the production of this talk. Ian did a sterling job. Darren did a sterling job. The guys did a bang up job and I could not have done any of this without them so blame them too. Um, I'd like to thank the con organizers for having me here. I'd like to thank you guys for putting up with me which is the important bit. If you want to have a word you can. I'm moderately easy to get hold of. Um, I'd like to also apologize for the bullet points to the, for those that care. Hi oh, sweetheart. Um, the reason they're there is because I wasn't sure how fast I'd have to go. So thank you very much for listening to me. If you want to know anything, or ask for anything, or basically punch me in the balls, I'll be outside having a cigarette, and then I'll be at our stand giving away free vodka and cake. Thank you very much. You've been lovely.